Right, so last time we were talking of different forms of convergence and um, we had four of them, right? Convergence almost everywhere in mean, in measure and almost uniformly. And for three of those, uh, you know, we can say if a sequence converges to some limit point F, but given some, you know, F 1000 and the limit point F, we can't really say how far are we away from you know, the limit point F. So what's the distance between Fn and F? You know, if you think about almost everywhere, how many points have come sufficiently close? Well, there's no way of quantifying that, right? You could just say whether it converged or it didn't converge almost everywhere. Same with the measure, same with almost uniformly. But the convergence in mean differs in this respect, right? So, because here we have, F minus Fn, the mu, this is a number which I can talk about whether it's small or not, it can be less than epsilon and so on. So here we can really talk about distances between two functions and um, so I'm going to give this a new notation, I'm just going to write F minus Fn and this double lines here indicates what is uh, called a norm. So I will get to that a little bit later. So the topic here is norm spaces. Okay, so for now, this is just one example of what we're going to call a norm. Um, almost anyways. What other examples of norm spaces do we have? Well, another example would be Rn, right? So here we have a set of all points, sequences, uh, vectors, if you want, in Rn. And given a vector, you know, x, maybe I put a bar on it, x1 dot 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 xn. So if I have like an x and a y, we can depict this. You know, we paint some axis here and then the paint this as a point, we think of it, you know, as a vector. Yeah, so if this is three dimensional space then the projections here, I would have x1 here, x2 here, and x3 here, those are the coordinates. And then the norm here would be the length of the vector, right? So here we have a norm. Get from the Pythagoras theory. Um, this norm is easier, easier to visualize and can also be used for talking about convergence because um, you now I can talk about x minus y, right? And well, I'm not going to write up what it is again, but the point is this we can uh, easily visualize. So if this is x, and here is another guy y, then the norm of x minus y is, uh, so, so the length of the vector from the tip of y to the tip of x is, is the norm here. So we talk, can talk about how close they are. Um, What's our space here? I mean, so here I have a space, right? Here I just have two functions. So what is the space here? So space is just a fancy word for set. The set on the consideration where this norm acts. We have to talk about what sort of f and fn we allow. And that would be something I'm going to call with a curly L1, okay? And if you want to be really picky, we can here also specify the underlying space X for set sigma algebra measure. And also that we're dealing with real functions, we could put complex functions and so on. Okay. Um, so this is a situation which we're a bit familiar with. So what are the properties of a norm? Well, um, 
If I multiply with a number, I can move that outside. Okay. But that's not really true. Because if it's a negative number, you know, here if I have alpha times x, I get an alpha square everywhere, I can pull it outside, but then I get square root of alpha squared, so that I get actually the modulus of alpha. And if you um, also are familiar with the counterpart Cn, where you take complex numbers, then you know that this formula is true for Cn as well. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay away from the complex numbers in this lecture. Okay, but we have norms in that settings also. And uh, corresponding here will then be the complex value functions. Okay, so this is one thing we can do with norms. Another thing is the triangle inequality. So if I do x plus y instead of x minus y, it is less than or equal to x plus y in norm. So how do I visualize that? Well, again, I have my space. Here's x, and then x plus y is what I get from putting the tip of, well, on the tip of x, I add the vector y, so the vector y is actually sitting here. And now x plus y, the norm of that is then the distance to zero, right? And this is, of course, less than this distance plus that distance. So this is um, comes from Pythagoras theorem, if you want. Do we have these properties here? Well, this is just uh, the idea from the linearity of, of um, either linearity or this is complex, and anyways, it's true. Um, what about Okay, so this would then be the norm of alpha f, and here I would have modulus alpha times the norm of f. If now I do this fitting, yeah, if I do the norm of f plus g, I get this integral. And here for every x, now there's parentheses x here, which I don't write out. For every x, I have the inequality that, well, this inequality. Okay, and now the integral is linear. So skipping that step, I get norm of f plus norm of g. So yes, we do have a triangle inequality as well. Yeah, so these are properties shared. Yeah, those are properties we want from a norm. The third property we want from norms Well, I forgot to mention one, which is kind of obvious. Um, I'll put it here in the end. So we want the norm of x to always be bigger than or equal to zero. That's clearly true here in both cases, right? We don't want negative distances. Um, but here comes an important point. If the quality, if and only if, so IFF, if and only if, abbreviation. So if something has distance, so, so the norm is like the distance to the origin. If the distance to the origin is zero, we want the object to be zero. Or if you think of it in terms of like measuring distance between two points like this, again, if the distance is zero, we want X and Y to be equal. Now here comes a problem. Of course, this is positive, right? Or non-negative. This is true. But the integral can be zero, even if function is not zero. So this is a problem. You know, just take the Lebesgue measure and the, the characteristic function of the rationals, for example, as an example of a function with integral zero, um, which is not zero in itself. So that's an issue we have to deal with, which is why to just peek a bit ahead, there is curly L1 spaces and without the curly L, uh, L1 spaces. And then there's a whole range of them LP spaces that we're gonna come to. But before that, so here I just want to say that, okay, there's some analogy between what's going on here and what we know, uh, have a more intuitive understanding of, namely Rn, we know from linear algebra. 
there is something which is not the property of a norm, but that we do have here. We have something called the scalar product, right? And um, if we're in the complex setting, we put a bar here on the second, but we're, we're not in the complex setting now, so I'm going to ignore that. Point is, what is this? This is something that's cosine of the angle theta between these two, and then the length of x and y. So here in this situation, I would have that this is the angle theta. So this is actually in a more higher dimensional setting is a way of defining angles because we have the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality of this in modulus is always less than or equal to uh, this product here. So there will always be some theta that satisfies this. So we can also get a more geometric understanding of this object. Here, we don't have this property, right? There is no way of, of, of somehow integrating f times g. There would be some other equivalent here. And then, um, Right, so how do we go from the scalar product to the norm? When well, we do this, right? We do the scalar product of x with itself and then take a square root. That's how you define the L2 norm uh, here. Here we don't have this. If I integrate f times g, if I, if I define a scalar product like that, and then I do the same trick. I'm getting the integral of modulus f squared and then with a square root. So that's not good because that's not at all the same integral as what we defined here. Actually, and, and this is why we need um, to consider a whole range of what's called LP spaces, right? So L, that's where this L1 here is coming from. This norm you get here would be what's called L2. Okay, but that's that's up ahead. That's what we're aiming for. Um, but to get there, we need to go through just the basics of norm spaces which technically does not belong to this course. It's a functional analysis or linear analysis, if you want. So, so hopefully you have seen it before. If not, this will be a crash course. So this is like a fast introduction to what's called Banach spaces. So what's the setting we need? Uh, what's the common denominator, except for having a norm of this guy and this guy? Uh, I was talking about this geometric intuition and, and it's somehow implicit in what I've been doing already. We can add stuff and we can multiply stuff with numbers, right? And, you know, there are many sets in mathematics where this is not allowed. So there's something called a vector space. It's just a set on which you have addition and then vice versa subtraction. You can multiply with numbers and it satisfies certain basic rules, just like Rn, they're made to mimic Rn. So these are, so the setting is you see, you can read about all of this in 3.2 in the book, so I'm not doing it too detailed, more like a expose. Okay, so norm space, you start with a vector space where you can add and multiply, and then you equip it with some sort of a norm. And this is then not a, it's a vector space, but it's not a norm space, because as we were just discussing, what we get here is not a norm, unless, uh, at least not for the Lebesgue measure, if you have, that's in the exercises. This is actually a, a, a norm space if and only if there are no sets with measure zero except the void set. So, so that's something you can uh, amuse yourself by proving. But usually this is not a, a norm space, it's just a vector space, okay? 
Um, so that's nice. We can think of any, we can just call it, well, now I'm not gonna call it X because X is this guy, but V. So V can be a norm space then, yeah? It can be anything. So either points like this in Rn or functions or something else, mathematical object. Um, the nice thing that once we are here, we can now start to think of function spaces or rather function, you know, functions normally we paint them like something like this. But if we think of all possible function that exist, let's say in the interval from A to B, and now I paint it continuously, um, we, we, we can give that some name. So C A B would be a natural name, continuous functions on A interval A B. That's also, well, it's a vector space. If you add continuous functions, you get new continuous functions. It's not a norm space, but there are different ways of adding a norm to it. If we add the supreme of norm, then, uh, yeah, this becomes a norm space. Here we have the property that the function is zero if and only if the norm is zero. So this is a norm space. Uh, this is not the only norm you can add, right? Uh, so this, uh, well, I'm not writing it out. You heard me. It is a norm space. Or we can take the norm from here. So let me call this infinity norm. I'm going to explain. It will be clear in a while why I did that. And then here's the alternative. Both of them are, well, okay, this is not a norm, but beyond that, they are norm spaces. But um, so, no, okay, so if I consider continuous functions, then the norm is zero if and only if the function is zero, because it's easy to see that you can never have a continuous function, cannot have a zero integral. Let's then use here lambda unless the function is identically zero. So both of these are norm spaces, okay? But this guy has the property that this one lacks. And that's something called completeness, which is something which is very desirable, uh, which we have here, which basically can be understood as follows, that if I have a sequence that converges, no, it seems like it doesn't, but let's say it gets, yeah. Then the limit point should exist. We want that, right? I'm not gonna tell you why this uh, has this property, but it's more instructive to look at an example where you do not have this property. So let's consider an example. Of functions here. So my a and b is going to be zero to one. And then here's my f1, it's a continuous function. Here's my f2. Here's my f3. Yeah, so you get the point. They're, they are all equal to one here. I just paint them a little bit differently. So you define this in a way. They're, they're, I'm just repeating here an example which is in the book. So uh, I hope you get the idea and then you can read the example three to four if you want technical definition. But the point here is that if you look at the difference between these two guys, I mean, here the difference is zero because they're both one. And then here you're going to have some sort of bump between, which takes values between zero and one. But you integrate in here the mean, right? So, so you're just going to integrate on this little piece, you get something non zero, and that value is going to be between zero and one. So you get a very small contribution. With the you know, dominating convergence theorem, if you want, you can realize that, okay, this, this integral is, is um, of the difference, it's going to be uh, very small for all functions. You know, even if I take the 1000, it's going to be very steep here and like this, but still, you know, the, the integral is not going to amount to much. However, it's clear that this sequence of functions 
converges, right? In an intuitive sense, it converges to the function which is zero here and then be equal to one. The only problem is that now I'm no longer in my space. Yeah? This is not a continuous function because it's zero here and then it jumps up to one. So somehow what intuitively was the limit point doesn't exist in the world that I have created by saying that this is my vector space. Okay, so here in this example, there was like an intuitive limit point and then we could say, okay, that limit point is not in the space. So there's some sort of problem here. But in a more abstract setting, how can you even, I mean, if you can't specify the limit point, I mean, if it doesn't exist, how can you talk about a sequence that like seems to converge, but doesn't have the limit point? How, how do we quantify this? It seems to converge to something, okay? The answer to that question is something called Cauchy sequences. So usually when we talk about convergence, I mean, here I would say that, okay, F minus Fn, I look at this in the norm and then I say that the limit goes to zero, then you have convergence to F. But if F doesn't exist, I can't really talk about this object. So I have to, I have to somehow remove F from the picture. Well, what can I do then? I can talk about the difference between two guys in the sequence, right? So Fn minus Fn. Well, what do I want for a sequence that like seems to converge? I want that this number is very small if both M and N are big. Okay, there we have a definition. This is called Cauchy sequences. So let me erase a bit. Well, let, let me continue writing here because now we don't need this any longer. So we have a norm space V and instead, well, you want me to call the sequence Fn like functions or Xn like vectors? I don't know. Let's take Vn, okay? So then we are not biased in any ways. A sequence Vn, n goes from one to infinity in you know, capital V, is Cauchy if for any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an n, which is a natural number, such that the difference between Vn and Vm is less than epsilon for all n and m which are big enough in the sense that they are bigger than n, right? So you have your sequence here. Da, 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 and it kind of says that you know the limit point doesn't exist, but it says, okay, I can somehow make a circle around here with radius epsilon so that they are all inside of this circle, at least a bit intuitively like this. Yeah. It's not clear where the center of this circle really is, but uh, at least for visualization. Okay, so this is Cauchy sequences. What do we want from Cauchy sequences? We want them to converge. We see here an example that that could or could not be possible in our space V. So we want to distinguish spaces V where the convergence point always exists from spaces where this doesn't happen. And that reaches now, uh, leads us to the definition of a Banach space. Okay, the actual property of having the limit point is called completeness. So V is called, B is called complete if every Cauchy sequence has a limit point. And then you can amuse yourself with proving stuff that, okay, if you have a limit point, the, if you have two limit points, they have to be the same. So the same sequence cannot converge to two different things and stuff like that. Um, so, okay, this guy, continuous functions on AB with this norm is a complete, norm vector space or just norm space. And then if we have all of those ingredients together, we call it a Banach space. Okay, and that was your crash course to 
Banach spaces and norm spaces. So this is all worked out in 3.2. There are many more examples than what I mentioned here in 3.2.1. They also talk about metric spaces, which is a bit more general, but we're just interested in norm spaces here. So that's a subclass of metric spaces. Uh, then they come to Cauchy sequence, Banach spaces, and they have this. Uh, they actually have a proof that this guy is a Banach space. That's very nice. It's actually a very nice argument, also. I'm not going to show it to you. You can read it here 3.2.3. .3. Then comes my example, this guy. And at the end comes a funny proposition that feels a bit out of place. Like when you read it the first time, it's like, OK, why, why, why do I need this? It's something about testing whether a space is complete or not, 3.2.5. We're going to need that when we're going to prove that LP spaces, some generalization of this, is, uh, has the completeness property. But to do the proof of that without knowing the application kind of just makes you like the statement in itself is, is a bit like, OK. Um, so it's more beautiful to talk about that when, when the problem actually arises. So I will ignore that proposition uh, for now. Um, yes. OK, so with that, this was your crash course to Banach spaces. Now we're going to talk about Banach spaces in the context of integrable functions. Voila.